for the EKGs. All right, you're good, Dan. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, so um, my name is Dan Popa. For the interns who don't know me, um, I'm uh, one of the faculty here. Um, I also have a um, subspecialty and I'm board certified in hyperbarics and undersea medicine. Did my training out on the West Coast. Um, so today, um, Scott's let me talk about um, drowning and submersion injuries. I got my also fancy diving shirt here um, to continue the theme from next, from last week rather. And then I've got some um, awesome uh, barracuda from the South Pacific floating around behind me. Um, feel free to interrupt me um, uh, and ask questions. I don't have the chat up, so if somebody wants to um, uh, yell out questions from the chat, that's okay by me. Um, so. I'm gonna try and go through the drowning and submersion injuries portion um, uh, a little bit quicker and then we'll get to, to um, uh, dive medicine. So what drowning talk um, would be um, complete uh, without um, the Hasselhoff? Um, so moving on, definitions. Um, so immersion, the whole body's um, uh, Basically, so body entry is going to be into a liquid medium, but then submersion the whole body, um, particularly the head, is going to be below the surface. So just to get our um, technical definitions straight. Um, now, with drowning, you'll have heard maybe references to dry drowning, wet drowning, active drowning, parking lot drowning, near drowning, all this other crap. No. It's basically been switched about 15 years ago and it's classified with morbidity. So basically everybody drowns and then it's a question of, do they have morbidity? Did they, was it a fatal drowning? Was it a non-fatal drowning? So epidemiologically, um, exact number, hard, hard to say. Um, it is um, uh, really, really prevalent, however, um, as you can see with these numbers up here, um, and often a leading death um, among children, unfortunately, especially during the summertime. So um, accidental childhood incidents uh, play a role in this, but also non-accidental injuries, um, something called shallow water blackout, which I'll be talking about a little later, alcohol as a role. Um, scuba diving, yes, but certainly not the most common um, etiology of drowning um, in this country. Um, hypothermia can also have a play. Um, okay, thanks for muting uh, yourself, Raul. I was getting some feedback, I think. I um, so factors common to drowning. Um, so it's overwhelmingly going to be males, unfortunately, who drown. Um, uh, there are obviously some, some females and women who drown, but it's far, far more common among um, males. Um, there's an unequal distribution among races as well, with minorities uh, uh, being overrepresented uh, among drowning victims. Um, the locations can occur in home swimming pools, bathtubs, um, even uh, buckets, uh, particularly in children. Um, alcohol has a major um, role, especially in younger males. Um, trauma, secondary to diving or falls, um, because again, uh, there's a picture here, a drunk young male diving off of something, because guys are dumb. Um, so pre-existing conditions, um, things like seizures and cardiac history can certainly play a role, um, but uh, the biggest is, uh, is gonna be alcohol. Um, so uh, 25 to 50 percent of adult um, uh, drowning vi victims have alcohol in their systems and, and then 20 percent of uh, boating related fatalities. Um, so uh, it, it's fun to drink on boats. I've definitely uh, done it but make sure the operator is sober just um, as you would operate uh, another motor vehicle like a like a car. Um, so pre-existing um, diseases, so I mentioned seizures, so seizures underwater um, can lead to aspiration um, and obviously ultimately drowning. Um, cardiac disease with arrhythmia is long QT syndrome. Scuba, um, so this is a whole talk in and of itself. Um, so just because you go scuba diving doesn't mean you automatically drown. That's why I have drowning in um, uh, in quotations there. So the most common 
uh, causes of fatalities among scuba divers are the same uh, causes for basically people on land. So actually cardiovascular disease is still going to be your number one um, killer, but there is there are other uh, things at play. So oxygen toxicity seizures, nitrogen narcosis, an arterial gas embolism, or did they get in, uh, entrapped by fishing lines or other um, underwater debris or obstacles, um, caves, things like that. So there's something else I want to put on your guys' radar. This is a, also another talk in and of itself. So something called SIPE, um, Swimming Induced Pulmonary Edema. And I don't know if Chase is on the call, but I know he loves my acronyms. Um, this is the this is the approved acronym. I'm sorry, there are so many acronyms in diving and, and <laughs> hyperbaric medicine, Chase. But um, yeah, so SIPE. Um, so I've got a picture of a racehorse there. Um, the reason being, so pulmonary edema, from a comparative physiologic standpoint, pulmonary edema uh, can be elicited in um, mammals, terrestrial mammals. So horses um, are a great example of this. Racehorses can get pulmonary edema when they get pushed really hard. So a trainer um, years ago had kind of figured this out and thought that he might be able to get a performance advantage by giving Lasix uh, to racehorses which is why you get the expression piss like a racehorse. Um, so they're usually hopped up on license. Um, so humans, um, it, uh, can they do that on land? It's a little bit controversial, um, but it definitely uh, occurs in humans underwater. So there's generally going to there's generally going to be two uh, types of populations who are going to be susceptible to sight, um, which uh, one will be uh, higher output athletes. So um, where I trained, we had a lot of military divers, swimmers, Navy SEALs. So that'll be these guys. So these are your 18 year old um, uh, guys who are otherwise completely healthy, but they're just putting out so much work that they're gonna end up with pulmonary edema um, uh, in the pool, although more often in the ocean. And then similarly, uh, triathletes. And just in case you think this is a coastal thing, um, it's probably better described among athletes, excuse me, among triathletes. Uh, and obviously there's lots of triathlons that go on even in the Midwest, in the lake here. And as we'll see, cold water is a risk factor. Um, uh, so cardiac workups important um, uh, in, in these people. I'd say even the young people um, require a little bit of a, a cardiac workup, but the other population um, where it's uh, older, um, usually divers, um, sometimes swimmers out in the ocean, um, they're gonna need a more comprehensive cardiac workup. But just so that you guys know, a lot of times if they do end up undergoing an elective cath, it actually shows up um, without any significant stenosis um, but uh, who's gonna who's gonna turn away um, a you know 55 year old female with a small trope leak and a presentation with shortness of breath and a pulmonary edema on her chest x-ray from getting a cardiac workup right Rush cardiology what's that the brush cardiology might but <laughs> fair enough but they shouldn't um, so uh, and you guys know how to how to manage this, really. So I'm not going to harp too much on this. This is going to be the supportive care and all this stuff that you would typically do with pulmonary edema. Um, so moving on to uh, a little bit of um, conversation about breath hold diving. So um, this has become much more prevalent in the past maybe 10 years or so, um, where there's competition breath hold diving um, as a as a sport. Um, it's a sport that actually has a high mortality surprise. Um, but also um, there'll be um, uh, fishermen, um, spear fishermen who will go down and spear fish too. That's become uh, a more common thing. So you can see the records down there, um, which are, are pretty impressive. Um, now I want to move it on to something that is a way to kill yourself um, by uh, doing free diving, which is this thing uh, called shallow water blackout. I'll go through this um, uh, through this graph, but basically the overarching message is if you hyperventilate so much, um, if you then go on a free dive on a single breath hold, you're at risk for basically blunting your PCO2 chemoreceptors that are giving you alarms uh, that say, hey, I'm running out of air, it's panic um, time, and I'm going to be blacking out soon. So if you blow down your PCO2 
to such a degree um, that you shut those off throughout the entirety of the dive, you're at risk for blacking out underwater. And so here, up here, this horizontal bar is going to be your normal oxygen level. And if you do a breath hold and then dive down underneath the surface of the water, the oxygen is going to decrease there. And then if you just have a regular um, single breath uh, and you don't hyperventilate, you're going to start off with your CO2 here and it's going to build and build and build and build. And then it's going to basically reach... Um, this critical PCO2 level where um, your chemo, uh, chemo uh, sensory mechanisms are firing off um, in the carotid body, but there's also some central ones. Um, and it's panic time. You're going to feel really uncomfortable. People who train in this, they can actually push past this a little bit. And by the way, why anybody thinks this is a good idea is a little bit... Um, uh, up in the air, but um, there are people who enjoy this and do training in this. Um, it sounds miserable to me, but then again, I have a really brisk CO2 response. So you can probably get up to here, but now if you go ahead and hyperventilate and you drop your PCO2 over here, and then basically you go on your dive and the CO2 is building up and the oxygen comes down, basically if, if you're really pushing the envelope You'll end up hitting the the uh, on on the time course here if you manage to hit your uh, to to make it all the way out here and to hit this line here where the critical PCO2 hits and you're feeling the alarm bells ringing right there. Um, right around that time, you're in the in this gray zone at risk for blacking out for sure because your PO2 um, has come down significantly. And then on the other hand, if you excessively hyperventilate you'll never really reach um, this level out here of the critical PCO2. You'll black out before you ever, you ever reach that. And so that's, that's the concern. In addition, um, you gotta remember that, especially if you go um, deep, uh, you are gonna have some pressure effects. Um, so some pressure effects in the lungs. So you got some partial pressures here. You'll start off 120 um, uh, millimeters on O2. You'll dive down. And despite having consumed some of the oxygen metabolically to get down there, your uh, PO2 is gonna go up at 149. Um, and you'll, you'll metabolize some more down there. And by the time you arrive back to the surface, you'll have dropped off really precipitously here, which is another risk factor. So does anybody, I, I know this is kind of kind of complex and I, I, I blew through it, but does anybody have any questions? I'll just pause there before I go on to, to another concept. Uh, Dan, just to make sure I yeah. know, this is the same thing as like narcosis of the deep, right? Or is this no, good question. This is different. So, um, and I'll, I'll, I can discuss that with the, with the diving um, medicine talk. So narcosis of the deep would be kind of the nitrogen narcosis, I think is what you mean. Um, uh, so yeah, it, these are kind of subtle things. So what can happen is even on a, on a scuba dive, if you go even an open water diver, um, so your basic level, um, uh, Patty certified diver. They're certified to about 60 feet. A little bit beyond that is where you can start seeing nitrogen narcosis develop. Um, so for your Patty open water advanced um, divers, which is the next level up, their, their depth limit um, is 100 feet. Um, and so between 60 and 100 feet, you're at risk for developing um, nitrogen narcosis, where the, um, the higher partial pressure of nitrogen um, serves as a narcotic, and you can start feeling uh, buzzed. Um, it's basically, we, we joke and call it Martini's Law. Um, so I think that's the one that you're um, mentioning, Harrison, and that's, the, that's not one that's going to show up with um, breath hold diving. Um, Breath hold diving is a, a bit complicated. With repetitive breath hold diving, you could actually end up causing yourself to get decompression sickness too, by the way. Anybody else have any questions? So the, the overall message here is if, if you're gonna hyperventilate, do so only minimally um, and don't um, do uh, any hyperventilation to excess because um, it is quite dangerous. So um, the, the mammalian diving response um, here, so I, I put up a picture of a, uh, of a sea lion underneath some kelp because 
we as mammals are um, uh, definitely not the champions of this. Um, the marine mammals are far, far more adept at, the, adept at this. And so the characteristics of this are going to be with apnea, um, you'll get um, some peripheral vasoconstriction and then bradycardia, um, things like water temperature, um, you're starting uh, ar arterial um, oxygen tension, um, uh, how panicked you are, these will all come into play. And this is important. Um, uh, a little bit, especially if we talk about um, young children with cold water um, exposures and survivability um, uh, it, during um, a, uh, a submersion injury, basically. So hypothermia um, can be protective. Um, and basically, there's the old thought that you're not um, dead until you're warm and dead. Uh, and just like Miracle Max said in Princess Bride, um, you can definitely be mostly dead and mostly dead is also slightly alive. So there's always been, um, or in the past, there's been some debate. Uh, is, are there different considerations in um, uh, fresh water versus uh, salt water drownings? Um, and there was some concern um, early on based on some animal studies, um, looking at comparisons um, in, uh, between fresh water and salt water, and that fresh water can lead to some electrolyte derangements and some surfactant disruption um, versus salt water can lead to some hemoconcentration. But the reality is, is it's, it, it, all paths are going to converge and it's it's really academic um so um you'll get some breath holding and then you'll get some um some gasping and then you may have some laryngospasm or maybe um maybe not and water may freely enter the airway and um you may aspirate so with laryngospasm um, that can be broken if you lose consciousness and you'll jump over here and aspirate um or it can persist um and ultimately, it doesn't matter because everything will lead to uh, alveolar damage, airway obstruction, hypoxia, and um, ultimately death. So um, uh, on the pulmonary side of things, uh, like I mentioned, the laryngospasm, you can get loss of surfactant, you can get some shunting, hypoxemia, um, and then you can later develop ARDS. Um, contaminated water, debris, things like, um, uh, especially if a surfer takes a tumble um, and you can get sand um, that, that gets aspirated, all possible. Um, neurologically, uh, you can get anoxia um, uh, with basically um, cardiopulmonary arrest. Uh, you can also get diffuse neuronal damage. Uh, potentially, the diving reflex has a protective role in here, um, and hypothermia um, appears to be somewhat protective, kind of similarly to um, what we'll do with our um, uh, some of our cardiac arrest, arrest patients. Um, so on the cardiac side of things, you'll get um, decreased cardiac output, um, in part from uh, hypoxemia on the myocardium, but pulmonary hypertension can play a role. Um, cardiac dysrhythmias are very common, um, and then you can also get some renal effects too. Hematologic doesn't seem uh, that that stuff that I mentioned um, in animals with hemodilution doesn't seem to uh, play out uh, in reality. Um, and then same thing with serum electrolytes, unless um, there's something else going on, like large volumes of uh, uh, of the water that's ingested. Clinical presentation can vary so widely. You can get anything from alert and looking totally okay to completely obtunded and comatose, cyanotic, coughing. Um, you can have tachypnea, tachycardia, even a, a low-grade temp. EKG can be all over the place. Um, you can even have some hypothermic changes there. Um, chest x-rays, uh, pretty important, I would say. Um, it can look normal, but you could also have um, uh, an edema looking picture, ARDS picture, um, CT uh, of the head um, in the right clinical scenario um, may be indicated and may show edema. So um, most of the complications are going to show up um, in the first four hours. Um, so bronchospasm, vomiting with aspiration, um, glycemic derangements, hypothermia, um, hypovolemia, um, acidosis, um, so after four hours, and these are going to be, these patients are usually going to be sick. Um, so uh, they can develop abscesses in their lungs, worsening ARDS, a coagulopathy. Um, they can have signs of barotrauma, renal failure. Um, so 
the pre-hospital care here is uh, very, very important and probably um, the most important uh, predictor ultimately of mortality. So this is gonna be the ABCs um, doing mouth to mouth and water. Compressions in the water are not recommended. Um, they're extremely difficult to do and also still maintain the patient's airway and make sure that they don't aspirate further. Um, no stomach pumping or Heimlich um, maneuver or anything like that is required. Um, and then basically it's all stuff that, and that you guys will have a good grasp on anyway. So treat the hypoxia, um, starting them uh, on uh, something that gives them a little bit of peep, um, for example, with a, a CPAP mask um, will, will help out and then watch out for trauma because concomitant trauma, especially from diving injuries is pretty common. So um, neck and uh, uh, back precautions there. Um, so terminating resuscitation. Um, so, uh, you know, if I'm out backpacking with my buddy um, and we're in the Rocky Mountains, you know, 14 hours away um, from the car and we don't have a sat phone or anything like that, and he decides to go off on his own and do some cliff jiving and bonks his head and then I find him 30 minutes later um, in the cold lake, I mean, gosh, um, that's going to be a very, very different scenario than um, somebody who has a, an injury during, um, say, like a, a triathlon um, here in the lake that's being uh, um, overseen by lifeguards um, or even somebody in a boat. So um, just remember that. Um, and it, basically, um, CPR, um, uh, Stopping after about 30 minutes is probably a reasonable um, uh, rule of thumb if you haven't gotten ROSC um, and you're out in the field in the meantime. So treatment priorities are going to be um, correction of the hypoxemia, establishing the airway, um, and then uh, also making sure that they're perfusing appropriately, and then correcting any um, uh, metabolic derangement like an acidosis. Um, so from the airway perspective, um, oxygen is going to be a, super important, no surprise there, um, but also um, uh, given a little bit of peep to try and um, stave off um, any fluid shifting into the alveoli is going to be important to making sure that we um, appropriately take care of um, the E in A, B, C, D, E, so their environmental exposure, so making sure um, that we cover them in blankets um, and uh, um, basically uh, manage the acidosis that we that we discussed some fluids um, if need be diagnostic studies really dependent on the situation it can be anything from just a, uh, a chest x-ray or even nothing um, if it doesn't sound very bad to the full ICU the full boat workup right ABG um, this is one of the few times where I'd probably want an ABG um, to help um, better determine um, uh, an alveolar um, uh, an arterial alveolar gradient and a gradient um, uh, talk studies as needed, uh, BAL, um, and then if seizures are at play, anticonvulsant levels, and then um, uh, head imaging if need be. Um, folks who get hospitalized, um, anybody that you're, um, you're worried about after about um, four or six hours at the most, so if they're having persistent respiratory symptoms, if they got um, a really abnormal chest x-ray, um, and then history of loss of consciousness. Um, so we want to remember our ARDSNET protocol um, and, and minimizing um, uh, patient's risk for ARDS. Um, so uh, keeping uh, the risk for barotrauma low. Um, so antibiotics, um, not indicated, just like with any other aspiration, um, not indicated prophylactically, but keep an eye out because um, especially with your ICU um, admits, they are at risk for developing infections. Uh, and just remember um, what your uh, what your bugs are going to be. So the ocean, um, Vibrio, Pseudomonas, but uh, you know people uh, do have to work unfortunately in sewers and in contaminated waters um, and can uh, undergo aspiration events there. So those are going to be a different set of um, uh, set of bugs. And then the last one, does anybody know, um, uh, has anybody ever heard of this one before? The brain-eating amoeba. Um, does anybody know where it's more common? Stagnant lakes, 
Yeah, in particular, warm water. Yeah, exactly. Um, warmer, fresh water. Um, and then um, also in hot springs too. So sometimes hot springs will have um, recommendations and signs um, to not go diving into them because uh, <laughs> this is really interesting. I, I think um, it can enter um, through the cribriform plate in the nose and actually that's how it ends up being a legitimate brain eating amoebic uh, infection. Um, that wasn't a, uh, an exaggeration. Um, so prognoses, um, so um, uh, the prognostic um, factors that can um, uh, basically lead to a good outcome. So if they're alert, um, potentially if they start out hypothermic um, and then they've been warmed and resuscitated and are doing okay, they were obviously briefly submerged. Um, if they got good on scene um, uh, BLS or ACLS care um, and then uh, basically Let's move on to um, poor prognosis then is gonna be the opposite, right? So if the CPR is still having to be done in the ED, um, if there's unresponsive pupils, if they were submerged a longer period of time, if resuscitative efforts have been prolonged, um, also uh, if they've got acidosis going on. So prevention, um, so a lot of this stuff will be pretty obvious to you, but things like having um, pool covers, learning CPR, um, uh, heating the buddy system and heating warning, uh, warning signs, especially for rip currents. So stuff like this, um, watching out. So that's a rip current, just uh, so you guys know, this is a shore, you get pulled out um, to see or to this body of water. And just remember always to swim parallel um, to the shore and that's how you escape and don't get sucked out further and further and further and don't try and fight this because you won't win. Mother Nature will always win. So having the appropriate pool barriers up, having appropriate um, boating precautions uh, with personal float flotation devices, PFDs um, there. Um, and then uh, teaching young kids to, to swim and even having uh, babies uh, so babies can be trained to basically roll over onto the backside and assume this position and then um, they'll do a lot better um, with submersions. So that's, that's the drowning portion. While I key up the next one, does anybody have any questions on that? I didn't see any other ones on the chat. Okay, cool. Um, so can you guys see this diving medicine one? I'm gonna... Yeah. Cool, okay. Um, so I um, stole a bunch of these um, uh, slides and um, photos from some of my um, former colleagues in San Diego. So sadly, these are not my dive pictures, although I've seen almost all of these uh, creatures underwater. Um, so dive injuries, they're often very dramatic. Um, and this is one off the coast of Southern California um, and can, uh, you know, can be pretty distressing and make the news as well. Um, and the reality is that scuba diving fatalities are actually um, quite rare um, in comparison to the number of divers and the amount of diving going on. So that's just a comparison. So it looks like even uh, a factor of, uh, of 10 safer than rock climbing, which is still also um, not that risky. Um, if you guys saw my talk last week, um, you'll remember uh, this slide. Um, so this one's important just so I can uh, reiterate some of the some of the pressure um, and depth um, uh, basic uh, measurements that we have. Um, sorry, Chase. Again, we have a bunch of uh, a bunch of acronyms here and abbreviations. So. Uh, absolute pressure is gauge pressure plus an atmosphere. So if we're at sea level here on this green line, we've got one atmosphere above us. But if we have a scuba diving gauge, it's going to read zero. So that if we do a dive below the surface of the water um, and we go to 33 feet of seawater, FSW, then we're going to hit one atmosphere on our uh, on our gauge or 33 feet on our pressure gauge. But the reality is, is we're under two atmospheres absolute or ATA um, there. Um, and then 
um, it goes from there. And then there's the, the stupid one, which is pounds per square inch gauge, which is uh, PSI, which pretty much nobody uses for good reason. Um, so diving medicine, we'll, we'll talk a bit about um, some barrow trauma today, which is really important, and then some decompression sickness as well. And some of the stuff we, we, I mentioned in um, my hyperbaric talk, um, so um, this is a rockfish just to illustrate, hey, if it's equilibrated at depth and we rapidly bring it up top, it's going to suffer some barrow trauma with eyes bulging out. This is its swim bladder, which you, it uses to equilibrate its um, uh, buoyancy um, in the water column and then if you take it back down it will basically go back to normal and so this is just a review Boyle's law super important for us um, in the diving world um, so pull back from high school chemistry or physics and you'll recall that um, uh, PV equals PV um, and so uh, pressure and volume are going to be inversely uh, related so if I take my my blowfish here and I'm at sea level and we call that one to one and we take it to 33 feet of seawater its volume is going to go down by a half right so this is what I meant when I alluded to in the hyperbaric talk that the biggest changes in in volume and in pressure are going to be near the surface right because at at 33 additional feet of seawater, it doesn't half again. So from sea water, from sea level, excuse me, to 33 feet, it's gonna decrease by 50%. But then I go another 33 feet uh, of seawater and it's not gonna go to 25, right? It's gonna go to 33. And then only at 99 feet of seawater is it gonna go to 25%. So it's not a linear uh, downward progression. So barrow trauma, um, so we'll, we'll talk, we'll divide it up into um, two different things that we'll talk about, barrow trauma of descent and then barrow trauma of ascent. Um, so barrow trauma of descent will be things like clearing your ears appropriately, making sure that the mask doesn't cause any problems. Because um, basically barrow trauma and diving can occur in any airspace that's uh, basically involved with the diver. Um, so let's talk about something that a lot of people don't think about, which is mask barrow trauma, right? Between your face, between your eyes and the surface of the mask, you actually have an airspace that's just subjected to um, Boyle's Law as well. And so you can end up with um, basically zombie looking eyes and a zombie looking face, um, things like this. Um, and so this poor guy ended up having a, a full face mask on um, and then under, under, ended up suffering um, uh, some, some uh, mask barrow trauma. And he ended up having um, a, uh, a basically like a, what looked like a retrobulbar hematoma. Um, and that's why I bring up. So it can be pretty se severe. Um, you can end up having proptosis, uh, diplopia, visual loss. Um, and uh, basically, if it's really, really bad, they're going to end up needing something like a, a, some stat head imaging, like an MRI or even a CT scan and an opto consult. Um, so uh, this was uh, that same guy. Um, uh, so you can see his bleed here on the right eye. So sinuses, um, same thing. You have all of these air-filled air um, sinuses uh, in your face there. And what can happen um, is with um, a congested nose, you could end up, or even a polyp here. And sorry, this is in French, but it's a really good um, uh, diagram there. You could end up with an obstruction here. You go down, the tissue swells, you get a little bit of bleeding there. Um, and that can cause you some problems. Um, so here's what I mean too. So you can end up with something like a mucus plug here. You descend, um, you get some swelling here, you get some bleeding there. And then when you surface, hopefully this plug dislodges and then this relieves. Otherwise it can be uncomfortable as well. So you can have some pain over the sinuses during descent. Um, 
the frontal sinuses are most common. You end up with bleeding, some epistaxis. You may even end up pain with pain in the upper teeth, right? Because you'll remember that the, the nerves for those teeth are, are very close, right, to the maxillary sinus. Um, and so you can get some referred pain um, uh, to the teeth there. And then you could also end up with some paresthesias in the maxillary division of, uh, of the cranial nerve number five. And so for this reason, um, you have to be very, very careful with diving um, with decongestant use. So some divers um, use that if they're feeling a little bit stuffy. So think of like commercial divers who have to work, um, that sort of thing. Um, but just be aware that you, you are at risk because if the medication wears off at depth, um, you may have trouble when you ascend. You may have what's called a reverse block um, where basically the pressure in the sinuses has built up at depth because you're under higher pressure. And then you have a new obstruction that comes comes in and as you ascend, basically that gas that's trapped in the sinus wants to escape, but it can't because now it's blocked by congestion. And so that's called a reverse squeeze. Um, so the treatment though um, is basically uh, decongestants and trying to relieve uh, that obstruction, um, analgesics, and then um, time. Very rare that it's gonna cause any major complications like surgical drainage. Um, excuse me, that will require um, a procedure like surgical drainage, but that's, that's that CT scan that I showed you where that guy had um, uh, a hematoma there. Um, so ear barotrauma, I alluded to this as well um, in the hyperbaric um, talk and why it's important. So that middle ear right here, um, it's going to be equalized through the eustachian tube, which with only about um, four, um, uh, four millimeters of mercury can collapse on itself and then uh, bas basically create a um, closed uh, gas filled space here that then is at risk for um, uh, for rupturing the TM here um, and being subjected to uh, Boyle's law. So um, recommend basically clearing your eustachian tubes, lots of ways to do that, valve salving, moving your jaw, swallowing, um, lots and lots of different ways. So that's basically gonna open up and stent open this eustachian tube and allow the, um, the air pressure from the oral pharynx um, the, and, and nasal pharynx to equilibrate in here and it'll all be um, uh, equilibrated with the water um, pressure out there. Um, so this, this shows that collapse, this shows that collapse there. And so what can happen is you can end up with negative pressure here, positive here, and then rupture through here. Um, so uh, obviously pain, no surprise is gonna be a big feature of this. Um, tinnitus is possible, vertigo is also possible. Um, you can even have some hearing loss. Um, if the TM uh, ruptures, uh, often that relieves the pain um, and in turn can also lead to um, some vertigo, nausea, and vomiting from cold caloric stimulation. Um, so there's different grades of, um, of TM, barotrauma, which I won't harp on, but grade five, you can see there's rupture there. Um, so a lot of times with treatment um, for the milder grades is simply just avoiding um, further barotrauma um, and then uh, decongestants and analgesics, things like anti-inflammatories to really help. Um, antibiotics are not indicated right off the bat, only if signs of infection show up. Um, if you develop a rupture though, um, so no diving for a month, um, and most of those TMs will heal on their own, but there's a small chance that they may need um, a, a patch placed by head and neck surgery, uh, and even antibiotic um, drops. Um, so antibiotic drops would be indicated in this case because they've been subjected to um, the, the dirty ocean water. So inner ear barotrauma is something that can also happen with forceful Valsalva, and you can see right there, that guy's ruptured. Um, uh, and that's a bigger problem. Um, so uh, features clinically will be very similar to middle ear barotrauma, um, but will also include vestibular um, disturbances, uh, things like uh, nausea, vomiting, vertigo, and it'll look like uh, a central etiology or central stroke. Um, so very, very concerning. Um, 
So avoiding increased CSF pressure, um, no altitude changes. So obviously they're gonna be done diving, but even flying might be a little bit difficult because um, uh, even just from the pressure changes from flying, um, that can be enough to cause um, further um, trauma and further injury to that inner ear. Most of them are gonna uh, also heal spontaneously, but um, they may require uh, surgical um, intervention. So other, other factors in barotrauma, I should say. So things like um, uh, blockage of the external ear canal can cause problems. Um, things with like a tight fitting hood. The skins can, sub can be subjected to it. Basically, if it's trapping um, any gas in there, you can end up with a, a squeeze and what looks like a hickey. And then um, much more rare, but certainly possible if you have poor dentition uh, and you're diving and you've got some gas or a, a, a a poorly um, done um, dental procedure or like a filling, things like that, that's had a gas space. And if you change um, uh, pressures too quickly, that can lead to um, teeth either imploding or exploding. So barotrauma of ascent. Um, so ears and sinus, so that was what I mentioned with the, the reverse squeeze. So if you take decongestants and you're okay going down, but you develop an obstruction and it develops while you're down at depth, while you're, while you're going up, you're gonna have all kinds of problems. And then something that's actually quite common, I've had it numerous times, something called art, alternobaric vertigo, um, which is where you have differential um, pressures going on in your middle ears, um, one ear versus the other. Um, I've gotten it even just swimming for long periods of time in colder water on one side. Um, if you're doing like side stroke or something like that, you'll get obviously a pressure differential there and a temperature differential there, which can cause uh, a vertigo sensation, usually just relieved by clearing um, the ears with a valsalva to uh, fully equilibrate the ears there. So something more rare, so if somebody comes in with a seventh uh, nerve uh, palsy and it's isolated and it's after diving, just be aware and remember this, it's not necessarily a stroke code and it's not necessarily a stroke, all right? So be careful about giving these people a TPA. So that seventh cranial nerve is gonna go through the middle ear um, and with pressure uh, effects there, you can cause what's, uh, what's uh, known as an ischemic neuropraxia. Um, and it's usually gonna resolve on its own. Um, they may have, they'll probably end up having a negative stroke workup if they even um, undergo it. But if the story is really good after diving, just remember that this is on the differential. Um, so, Here's just a review to that ascending, right? That you can end up with um, some pulmonary barotrauma, which I'll get a lot more into. So if for whatever reason you hold your breath, um, the, uh, the effects of Boyle's law are gonna lead to um, some volume expansion um, to the point potentially of alveolar failure and rupture. Um, so, uh, and it can run a spectrum, as with so many things. Um, it can lead to local lung injury with um, mediastinal um, gas. There can even be subcutaneous gas, the worst case scenario, pneumothorax or arterial gas embolism, AGE. So um, I, I really like this graphic. Um, so AGE um, will, will be secondary, the, the problems and the sequelae that we worry about are gonna be from the bubbles, um, and particularly bad in the CNS, where it's gonna come tearing through the endothelium and cause irritation and then set off um, a cascade of um, inflammatory uh, pathways that lead to vasogenic edema and um, uh, basically can cause cellular injury and further edema, and you end up in this, in this um, uh, potentially deadly spiral. Um, so can I have somebody interpret this chest x-ray for me? And don't say COVID. <laughs> Heroin. What's that? <laughs> Heroin. Heroin? No. <laughs> Maybe, but probably not. All right, so there's actually a pneumothorax right here, and maybe even over here, and then there's obviously really, really bad junky ARDS, and this person 
it's hard to see, but I think they're intubated. I think there's a tube in there if I hallucinate well, um, but not 100% on that, right? How about this one? Somebody please interpret this one. Because I've had one that looked like this, um, and it was a little bit more subtle than this. Um, for a guy who came in for chest pain, this was to an urgent care. He hadn't been diving, and he showed up with this, and the radiologist read this as negative. This is a pericardium. There's some air in it. Right. So you're looking right here. So pneumopericardium, which is really good. Easy to miss a lot of times if your clinical suspicion isn't high. Also has some air tra tracking up here, too. And there's probably some air up around here. So let me see. This, do you guys see? This is from an autopsy, obviously, right? This is brain tissue, and you can see there's bubbles through here, here, right? So this one is going to be hard to interpret, but basically AGEs can cause um, all kinds of arrhythmias, um, more bubbles, too, on autopsy. So clinical presentation, this can run a gamut as well. So immediate death um, is rare, but if a diver surfaces and they collapse um, on the surface and if they had a rapid ascent, um, AGE is definitely very, very high on the, uh, on the differential. Um, but it's actually the minority of cases. Um, those patients, though, that do surface, they'll have usually a loss of consciousness first, then they'll arrest. Um, but the, the more typical clinical presentation is usually they'll surface and they'll start having um, a variety of different neurologic symptoms that often progress. Um, and it'll usually occur in the first 10 minutes. So can somebody interpret this EKG? There's a number of findings on the, excuse me, on this chest x-ray, there's a number of findings on this one. So it's either the largest gastric bubble I've ever seen or that's just uh, pneumoperitoneum. Okay. I buy that it's pneumoperitoneum. What else you got? So that's one finding. There's probably at least four findings on this. Tension pneumothorax. Tension pneumothorax. Okay. N the pneumothorax over on this side, right? Okay. What else? He's intubated, right? Or mm -hmm. this person's intubated? So that's the other one. What about the heart? Take a look at the heart. A little bit of tamponade, kind of like um, glass shape. Probably a little bit more than that. Looks airy. Exactly. So this this person had so much gas load that their heart, right? Their heart should be much more opaque, and you could almost see all the way through it, right? So their their ventricles and their atria, it's basically dilated with gas. Um. So. So more on the clinical presentation. So these patients may have chest pain, shortness of breath, even some dysphagia, some hoarseness. But the biggest thing is the neurologic symptoms, I would say. So anything from confusion to full-on loss of consciousness and seizure. They can have blindness, paralysis, paresthesias, a focal neurologic deficit, or a patchwork of neurologic deficits that aren't making any kind of sense in a distribution. And the more tricky thing is it can be very, very subtle. Memory, fine motor abnormalities. So let me show you guys. I'd like to show you a video. This is, this is going to be really sad for you guys to see. But this is going to, you guys will watch an AGE happen in real life. So this is from the Dutch military. This is basically training. Um, so. We had a um, Dutch naval officer, um, uh, an undersea a medical officer, give us this video. So this is going to be the instructor over here. And this is uh, basically the trainee here. What he's going to do is a free ascent um, from depth. So mimicking a malfunction or an out of air drill. So he's going to take off his mask and basically swim up to the surface along here. And what he should be doing is not holding his breath. And so we'll see here. Um, he's going to take off his mask in a second. Um, yeah, how deep is he? We'll see. He's maybe, maybe, um, my guess is 
Uh, probably on the order of 20 to 30 feet. So like probably seven to 10 meters. I don't remember the exact depth. Um, so let's take a look. So he's taken off his mask and he starts ascending. Notice right here, not a whole lot of bubbles and keep watching. The angle is going to switch. Still not a whole lot of bubbles coming out of this guy. He keeps ascending and you'll see this instructor tap him on this head and say, hey, open up your mouth. All of a sudden bubbles come out. And now you can see the appropriate amount of bubbles coming out of this guy. This guy is a bubble factory right here. Okay, so he gets to the surface, right? Sorry, there was a little bit of a lull. And then watch when he's starting to swim away from the line. Watch his right leg. It'll switch in a second here to an underwater view. And watch, here's the trainee here. Watch his right leg here. Wait for it, 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 and boom. He's paralyzed. Huh. So that is what happens in real life. And he ended up getting um, getting sent to the chamber and treated, and I think he had a pretty good outcome. Um, so that's what it'll look like in real life. Um, kind of sad. Um, so clinically, what, what should you guys do? Um, so physical exam, look for signs of crepitus, look for signs of barotrauma, and then a complete neurologic exam. I'm talking the full thing, and, and including a mini mental status exam, because the changes can be quite subtle. Um, I've had patients who have been diagnosed with AG and we've treated um, in the chamber, and their only, their only symptom are is basically an inability to do the serial sevens. And these are young, very intelligent people like military personnel and pilots who should be able to do simple um, uh, subtraction very easily. So it can be quite subtle. Um, biochemically, if we check some labs, they may have an elevated CK, um, but there's no true biomarker. There was a study published by one of my mentors um, back in the day who looked at, um, and this is diving AGEs, iatrogenic AEGs that we may cause in the hospital. It's a little bit of a different beast, um, but uh, they, uh, he described basically um, massive CK elevations in divers that had clinical diagnoses of AG. So maybe, maybe CK is uh, a biomarker. Radiographically, um, they may have evidence, like, uh, like on a chest x-ray of some barotrauma or some infiltrates, but the sensitivity and specificity is not going to be very good. And then if they're gorked or have some neurologic dysfunction, if you think you're going to see bubbles on a CT or MRI, you're probably not. Because by the time that you're going to get them into the, the scanner, um, whatever modality that you use, it, the bubbles are probably going to have been gone. Um, and they're in that cascade of inflammation and edema and all of that badness. So the diagnosis is one that's primarily clinical with some, uh, some physical exam findings, but a lot of history too. So the diving history, did they have a, a rapid ascent? Um, having access to their dive computer will be helpful for that. Did they have any loss of consciousness? Did they have any neurologic findings on your exam? Um, and then if there's... Um, no symptoms aside from an abnormal chest x-ray. So if they have a little, just a little bit of touch of mediastinal air, but they're totally fine as far as you can tell. Otherwise, they're not desatting, nothing like that. I would say that patient doesn't need to be treated, doesn't need to be transferred, nothing like that. So they just need a little bit of time and observation and probably some repeat chest imaging at most to see if, if their air leak is getting bigger for whatever reason, or if it's stable slash resolving. So we'll mix it up here um, and, and change to decompression sickness, which has gone by many, many um, colloquial terms uh, in the past. Um, so 
this creepy baby um, is supposed to also be mimicking what the uh, many Victorian um, era women were subjected to with corsets um, and why they call um, DCS uh, decompression sickness um, the bends because basically it can cause affected patients to look like they're in this position. Um, I don't know. I don't really like <laughs> that terminology. We just say DCS. And you guys may remember um, from my last week's talk, um, so decompression sickness was first described not in divers, but in caisson workers. So caissons are these bridge pilings there um, that are below um, the uh, surface of a river. And in order to keep moisture out down here at the base, um, so this is a staircase and this is where the workers are working, in order to keep that area dry, they've got to pump in compressed um, gas. And so uh, this doctor, and Andrew Smith, was one of the first ones to describe decompression sickness and then recognize the effects uh, or the beneficial effects of recompression in the workers on the Brooklyn Bridge in the 1870s, in the early mid 1870s. So this is going to um, get slightly um, maybe traumatic for you guys because this is going to delve almost into the world of physics and mathematics. Um, with tissue loading, but I just want to make a few points here. So this guy Haldane with the awesome mustache um, was a um, was a brilliant Scottish physiologist uh, who basically at the turn of the last century, um, so over a hundred years ago, um, came up with the first working theory as to what causes decompression sickness with tissue loading and nitrogen, and then how to how to try and solve that issue um, with, um, with prescribed treatments and decompression tables. Um, so he had this idea that the body is divided into various compartments. Compartments in the sense that they're gonna take on gas at different rates. So that bone tissue is gonna be different than fat tissue, which is gonna be different than the blood in its ability to take on um, primarily nitrogen and that they're gonna have super saturation ratios. So this is a very simplified model um, and kind of alluding to what I just mentioned there. So all of these tissues are gonna be subjected to these gases, but they're gonna take on um, by diffusion that gas in various rates. Um, so uh, this is why it's important in decompression sickness. So uh, basically at one atmosphere, we're in equilibrium here. We go down to depth on a scuba dive here and um, uh, there's more, uh, sorry, can you guys hear me okay? I, I got a, I got an alert that maybe my internet connection had crapped out. No, you're good. good, keep going. You're good, it was just like one quick blip, you're good. Okay, cool. Um, so down at depth, uh, on the inspired side, we're gonna have a lot more molecules of gas bouncing around in a much higher partial pressure. So then the tissue is gonna start taking up um, that, um, that extra gas. And then if we stay down long enough, it's going to end up in equilibrium. Then if we basically decrease the ambient pressure, we're going to be at risk for um, uh, causing basically rapid transfer of these molecules of gas and bubbles. And the main thing is nitrogen, the, at least in scuba divers who are diving on air. People do all kinds of crazy shit though. They'll add helium into their gas mixes. They'll change their, the, the percentage between nitrogen and oxygen, something called nitrox or enriched air. So this is this primarily when I'm talking about gases and that sort of thing and nitrogen, I'm primarily talking about in the proportions of compressed air. So this again, a little bit more in-gassing. So um, with increased pressure, you're gonna be taking on more molecules of gas in the lungs. They're gonna be distributed um, through the blood and ultimately into the tissues, and then vice versa with the decreased pressure. So um, here, if we go on a scuba dive and we do a very square profile is what it's called, we drop straight down to 100 feet of seawater and we stay down there for 25 minutes and then come straight up. 
So different tissues are gonna basically take on the gas differently. So this is gonna be a slow compartment, right? Because it's gonna take on gas very slowly and then it's not symmetric. It's gonna off gas slowly as well. Um, and this is just uh, minutes um, after dive, after we reach surface. And then um, a five minute compartment here is gonna take on and basically peak and then go off a lot quicker with a different appearing curve. So to kind of summarize, if there's a rapid reduction in pressure such that there's not enough time for elimination of nitrogen from the tissues, nitrogen then can come out of solution and cause bubbles, which is gonna be problematic. So again, as, as a reminder, this applies not only to divers, but anybody that works under compressed air or compressed gas. So aviators, astronauts, tunnel workers, those sorts of folks too. So more, more of the same types of curves. So increasing pressure here um, versus time plotted here. So these are gonna be ambient pressure here, tissue pressure, and then um, alveolar pressure say in the middle. And so with time, we're gonna get some loading of, of, of the tissues here, but at some point there's gonna be a gradient if we come out too quickly. And this is a super saturation, which uh, this is a PSS. So that difference there um, can lead to bubbles forming. And ideally, we match this up pretty well and try and not produce a gradient like this to lead to bubbles, right? So what can happen too is with circulation, you get a little bit of nitrogen coming out of solution and there's thought that there's debris floating around um, in, in the blood, something called microparticles. Uh, portions of um, cellular membranes that serve as the nidus for bubbles that can then add on more and more and more nitrogen and then go tearing through the endothelium and cause you problems. The same types of stuff that I mentioned with arterial gas embolism. So the bubble disease and the effects of the bubble are going to actually be pretty similar. Um, so, but the question is, is where are the bubbles and where are they causing the, uh, the symptoms and the and uh, and the most problems. So with decompression sickness, because it is coming out of solution um, first, or very often, I should say. So arterial gas embolism, it's in the arteries, right? And so it's going to be often the neurologic system that's hit. Whereas decompression sickness, you could end up with bony pain because it's in the bones. You can end up with occluded lymphatics and swelling. Um, so Ultimately, it can lead to activation of platelets. Um, it can cause also the inflammatory cascade to be activated. So neutrophils uh, activated, coags uh, elevated, nitric oxide. It can cause leaky capillaries um, and uh, on a more global systemic um, uh, side of things. It can cause hemoconcentration, even shock. So you may recall, I mentioned there's two types of decompression sickness, type one, which is gonna be primarily joint pain, um, but may also involve the skin, which I'll show you some pictures of. And then type two DCS, where the hallmark there is gonna be some neurologic symptoms. Very rare to have pulmonary symptoms, but you can. Um, and then the vestibular, the inner ear decompression sickness, which I, um, uh, which is very similar to um, the inner ear barotrauma that I mentioned before as far as symptoms. So the pain that's described uh, of decompression sickness in bones, um, it, it's usually in the joints. It's, it, it may be hard to localize one particular spot. They may just say, hey, my entire shoulder hurts um, and it feels like it's throbbing. Um, and then one of the other key hallmarks is that it's not exacerbated by movement. And the thought is, is that there's bony death going on in there. So it's literally bone cells necrosing, dying, and then releasing a bunch of factors that are then causing irritation or maybe even some increased pressure um, in, in those bones causing that deep kind of boring pain versus a, if you get some trauma and a, 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 you know a contusion to the bone um, or um, some muscular soreness, that'll be a little bit different. So this here 
it may be a little bit subtle, but but there's some what looks like some lacy erythematous changes in the skin there, and you can see it a lot more in this. So this cutis marmorata, which is not pathognomonic for skin decompression sickness, so other things can 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 see can cause this, and, and some people even have um, this on a day-to-day -day basis, just normally. Um, or sometimes even from the cold. But usually with decompression sickness, it's much more pronounced and it may be patchy and localized in one spot. So this is from an autopsy. Um, so this guy had pretty significant um, uh, hit there. So um, time to onset is gonna be a bit longer and more prolonged than your arterial gas embolism. So, and almost all of them will be within three hours. Very rarely is it going to be delayed, and I would wager that most of these delayed effects were from people who either drove over a mountain range or flew after diving. Um, because if you then change your ambient pressure even more than sea level, right, you run the risk of further decompression sickness. So you can have gotten done diving and be totally, totally fine and then hop on a plane too early and then cause yourself to get decompression sickness from that. Um, so I'd say these numbers are a little bit off. I haven't had a chance to update these and really dig in deeper, but the, ma the majority of decompression sickness at large is going to be joint pain. And that's going to include military divers and commercial divers, but in sport divers, um, uh, there is a, a, probably a little bit of a higher risk of neurologic symptoms just because there's people trying riskier stuff. It's not as well regulated, that kind of thing. So we'll move on a little bit um, and kind of bring up the idea that, that AGE and DCS can look very similar um, and the treatments are, are very similar as well, but there are some subtle distinctions. So AGE is usually from ascending um, and can also be at any depth. Um, so somebody dives you know, in just 20 feet of water, they can actually get an AGE for ascending too quickly, like you saw on that military diver um, that I showed you versus he could have stayed down at that depth for basically hours and then come up um, uh, exhaling the whole time and he could he would have been fine. There's no way he could have DCS at that point. The onset of symptoms is a little bit different and also the time, uh, the type of symptoms uh, is also gonna be a little bit different. So you, you can't always tell the difference and there's even sometimes overlap, um, but the main importance is getting them the appropriate care. So and that's gonna start pre-hospital, on the beach, on the boat. Um, so remember your ABCs, proper positioning of the airway, getting them uh, oxygen started immediately. You're not gonna go wrong with giving these people oxygen, potentially starting them fluid, and then getting them transport um, to the appropriate uh, uh, ED for evaluation. So as far as, um, uh, evaluation from the emergency perspective of a diver, something that I encourage you guys all to do is get an understanding of what their dive profile was. Um, just ask them what kind of diving they were doing, what gas mix they were doing, and if possible, if they've got their dive computer. They'll want to hang on to that and, and keep it with the patient because ultimately if it's going to get reviewed by, by somebody deciding to do hyperbarics, they'll take a look and see because that can plot the trajectory of how quick they were ascending. So if basically no alarms were going on the ascent and their dive profile is pretty, pretty unprovocative, then maybe they've got something completely different and it's not even AG or decompression sickness. Or Maybe they're doing something completely off the wall and, you know, they went down for 200 feet and they went down to 200 feet of seawater and stayed down there for an hour and then didn't do a decompression stop. And now they've got symptoms. It's like that slam dunk decompression sickness. Um, so again, do a thorough neuro exam and that, and that would include doing reflexes, Romberg test, if they can, if they're awake enough, mini mental status exam. Um, and then also consider urinary retention because they may also um, have gotten a spinal cord hit too. I have seen that. Um, and place them on 100% um, O2 and then potentially a, a, a trip to the chamber here. So recompression treatment. So 
yeah, the, the bubble size, shrinking the bubbles may be obvious to you, but also the other stuff that I mentioned too, the redu um, with, hyper with the hyperbaric lecture, so reducing that um, ischemic reperfusion injury and the cascade that goes all along with it, that's also important with hyperbaric. So these AGE patients or DCS patients, we'll sometimes treat them you know, even more than 24 hours after their initial injury because it can sometimes take that long to evacuate a patient. Um, but we still will absolutely treat them in the hopes that we can try and reverse and try and snuff out that cascade. So the treatment tables, um, so there's the variety of the treatment tables, very similar to what I mentioned um, during my hyperbaric talk, but in case you missed it, so just real quick review, this is kind of the workhorse if, they, if, if a patient's got really bad decompression sickness or AGE. So I won't go too much into depth, too much into depth with this there'll be periods when they're on air and 100 percent oxygen and the whole treatment can last quite a long period of time so almost five hours um, and then we also got to be careful about our tender the patient the person who's accompanying the patient inside too so that they remain safe there's been some talk about some adjunctive therapies um, with fluids, steroids, anticoagulants, lidocaine, but nothing's ever really been shown to help aside from decompression sickness. I'm wrapping up, I promise. Um, so if you guys ever have a question um, about a dive-related injury or even where the nearest hyperbaric chamber is, um, you can always look up, um, not me, not this Dan, but it's Divers Alert Network um uh, that dan and then there's an emergency uh number that basically you can call 24 hours a day seven days a week there's a, even an, a, an international hotline so if you're traveling and doing diving abroad you could actually get in touch um with them that way so with that i will open it up to any questions anybody's got I didn't see any more in the chat. Got it. Is it all Chase complaining about me with uh, abbreviations? No. <laughs> it's all about how people are scared to go diving. <laughs> that said, diving is very safe, remember? And so uh, there's a couple basic rules of diving. Number one, never hold your breath while breathing from a scuba tank for the reason of AGE. It's just always keep breathing kind of like dory just a, a a little bit of a a spin instead of just keep swimming keep breathing it's actually a very safe activity and before you go diving everybody who goes diving has to review all of these bad things which are terrifying but as like part of your training you have to look at all of it and then you get a test about it and it's like yes all these bad things could happen to me but it still sounds cool so i'm gonna do it here I go. Anyways, I, I agree. Diving is safe. You just have to be careful. Yeah. And overwhelmingly, people people that I've seen get injured are usually um, working outside of their comfort zone doing or doing things that, frankly, that, that they shouldn't be doing. Um, so, um, yeah. Like going into caves when they're not supposed to or going into wrecks when they're not supposed to and not having the proper training. So um, when you hear about a lot of scuba diving deaths, they are secondary to people doing some of these more riskier subsets of um, diving. It's kind of like driving your car on on um, regular streets versus on the highway versus taking it out on you know, going off-roading or going on a, you know, being a Formula One racer, you know, a little bit different. They're all deaths from driving, but they're going to be different. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. I said, thanks, Dan. <laughs> no, no problem. Sorry to take up so much of you guys' time. That was great. It was, I want it was... to review these, these comments. Favorite places to go diving? Solomon Islands. Thailand. Nice. For me. What's that? I was just reading it, Thailand. Um, cool. So everyone go get lunch, go relax, uh, get your energy for saving the world. Um, and we'll be in touch with any updates of anything else.
Any anyone else have any comments before we're signing off? And then Dan, you can unrecord too. Yeah, I probably should do that. <laughs>